All right, hello everyone. This is product manager of Mocha, Martin Brennan, and today we're going to be going through a bit of dirt and grime and how to track it into shots. We're going to cover two kind of major areas. We're going to do glass uh, and how to track glass to put dirt in place, and we'll talk a little bit about how that dirt should collect. And then we're going to do a shot inside Nuke doing a sort of decal versus paint dirt clean up, so to speak, by adding dirt to a very clean shot and sort of working out where it should go on the body and how to track that in with mesh warping. So we've got a bit of low latency here where I'm recording at the office, so I'm going to turn my face off and we'll switch right over to the screen. And there we go. So we're going to start in After Effects today. And we're going to work with this shot here. So we have got to scrub through the shot a bit. What we've got is a woman walking up to the window and tapping on it. And then the camera pans up here. And we'll just play that back. And she waves a lot and then beckons someone in. So we've got a few major problems here where you've got to start to deal with when we're dealing with uh, tracking this shot. We've got... For start, the reflection. There's a major bright reflection of the trees here that's going to throw things out. We've also got her in the background making huge movements all the time. So we're going to have to be very specific with our tracking areas, but it's also not going to save us. We're going to have to get into the meat of adjust track to actually fix this. So I'm going to start by opening up Mocha and we'll get started. I'm going to start on a new version. So let's come over to example two and we'll just delete this version. And we're going to go up and start. So I'm going to come over to my effects and presets. We'll type in Mocha. We'll grab our, if my mouse would like to behave itself. Fine, you do that. having a fun time already. There we go. So we'll drop that on and then we can just open up Mocha. All right, so a little bit of housekeeping. We're currently using the most recent version of Mocha Pro. So this just came out this week, 9.5.6. So update if you're up to this version because it's got a lot of nice enhancements and fixes. So Let's just play back this shot again and have a look at what we're dealing with here. So really, in order to track in to put grime into this shot, we only really have the edges of the window here. And it's also a little bit tricky because the edges are actually under glass themselves. So we're going to do the best with what we've got, and then we will use Adjust Track to fix it up. So I'm going to stream through this reasonably quickly in the hour. So we're going to hopefully get to the half hour point, And then if we're running a little bit behind schedule, I'll show you uh, an already tracked version so we can get through it. So how we approach this shot is essentially deal with the corners. I'm going to come up to my X-spline tool here. And I'm going to start drawing some edges. I'm going to start with this very clean area here. So we'll draw all the way up and around just capturing these edges here and then I'm going to right click and smooth out sorry straighten out those corners so they're sharp because we're going to try and get a little bit of the outer edge of these frames I'm going to pull them in fairly tight because I'm just going to scrub through again if we don't keep these edges tight, her hand is really going to throw everything out here. So we're trying to keep it a little bit close to those edges. In there. And this side's not too so bad, so we'll keep that out there. We might get thrown out by the reflections a little bit, but we'll fix that later. Secondly, we still have a lot of good detail over here, so I'm going to create a secondary shape. So I'm going to come to my x tool, drop it down. And we'll add X plus. And I'm going to do the same here. I'm just going to come all the way along, up, all the way to the top here. And just grab everything I can. And when you're tracking stuff like this, you really do want to track as much as you can that you can get away with. 
So once again, we're just going to pull out those corners by dragging one handle with right click. And I'm just going to get it tight into those corners. Now, normally we would suggest actually having overlap here so that you have a little bit of edge outside of what you're tracking to give background. But there's so much going on here in terms of reflections and highlights and the person behind the glass that we really have to avoid as much as we can in order for it to not be thrown out. So that's about right. So let's turn on our mat here so we can see what we're covering. So we're going to track this in perspective. So I'm going to turn perspective on and let's just zoom out a little bit with the mouse wheel. And I'm going to turn on my surface here and line it up approximately. Let's also turn on our grid so that we can actually see this. Come over here. Oh, I'm pulling on a spline corner there. Let's turn off the splines for a second so I can see that. So there it is. All right. And we'll turn off the mat so we can see that. So I'm just lining it up very basically. So I'm going to come up to this frame edge. Let's find that. Let's pull it down into the corner. Pull it all the way up. And we'll just use those grids to align the you know, approximate perspective. We can always fix this later. It's never locked in place. So that's looking about right. All right, so let's just turn our splines back on so we can see what we're doing. I'll turn off the grid for the time being so we can see and we can start tracking forwards. I'm using quite a minimum amount of pixels here so this is 20% and then this is also again by design like we could ramp this up to 90 but when we're dealing with such problematic shots here sometimes less is actually better because it's not finding all the extra information that's going to track. So I'm going to leave the default to 20 and we can start tracking forwards and this should be a reasonably quick track Guys, we're only dealing with HD footage on this one. If we were dealing with something slightly heavier, I would probably even just use a, a proxy to actually reduce those pixels because it's kind of counterintuitive. Sometimes you do want less information and you can fix this sometimes by clicking on pre-processing and blurring some more because sometimes blurring actually helps you rather than hinders you. Okay, so we're seeing a little, you can see right now, we're also getting a pull here where this big highlight of the trees is coming through. You can already see it's going slightly off skew. So we'll fix that in Adjust Track. So we're almost finished tracking. Let's just turn on the grid so we can see. Yeah, so you can see that skew happening here all the way over to the side. All right. So let's just reline this up again. I'm going to pull this back in just to make sure it lines up. So this is where we sort of do our checks. I'm going to pull in a insert clip. So let's just bring in the grid. And we're going to go over to the insert module and I'm just going to send it to like a screen. Maybe overlay would be better. Let's do overlay. Yeah, there we go. Overlay just helps us see how well it's locked in. So I'm going to just drag this into the middle square where we can see it. Let's just turn off the grid for a sec and our splines. And we'll pull this insert in. And this is a really good way to actually just visualize how well it's gone. So I'm going to go play back that shot. And it actually hasn't done that badly. There's a little bit of drift, so we're going to bring it over into Adjust Track and see if we can fix that. So let's go over to Adjust Track. So I'm going to be using the Transform Adjust Track. Uh, it's well recommended to update to 9.5.5 or 9.5.6 because we added this new thing called Keyframe All Points which just makes it very clear when you're keyframing all your points in the shot and when you want to turn it off. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I recommend looking at Elizabeth Postal's uh, tutorial on advanced keyframing in Adjust Track 2 because it really helps uh, cement the concepts for this module. So I'm going to create a perspective set of points and we're just going to click Set Points. Now, at the moment where they stand, they're not actually useful because they're all the way over here. Let's just turn off our insert clip. 
and we're going to replace these points around. So I'm going to move, let's just hide the surface for a second, and we're going to move these points somewhere useful. So first of all, let's turn on our zoom window. So I'm going to not use this corner here because this corner actually disappears. If we drag through the shot, you'll see it goes out. We could fix this by adding additional points later, but we've got so much in the shot, I'm not going to waste my time doing that. I'm just going to find a different point. So up here, there's a nice little shiny point under the window, which I'm going to continue to use. So you can see that in the top left window over here. And I'm going to bring this point over to the far corner to about here. Same goes for up here. This point, let's bring over to an easy corner over here. So there's a nice point where that frame wedges into the side. And finally, we'll bring this point down. And where can we put that one? Let's bring it down to, oh, this is a nice shiny area. So let's go with this. I'm gonna put it in the corner, actually. Right there. So this is not classically what you would do with like the classic uh, adjust track. With the transform one, you can put the points anywhere. And as long as they're adjusting relative to the perspective, it doesn't matter where they sit. So we've got four points now sitting in the right places. I'm gonna set that reference frame. Actually just move that up a little bit actually just make sure it sits in the corner. If you want to get some more granularity when you're moving stuff around, just hold down uh, Command or Control plus the Shift key, and then you've got what's called the, like the slow moving, it's like snail pace kind of movement, so that you can get more accurate pixel adjustment. All right, so we've got our points. So we're just going to go through now and look at each individual point and see what they're doing. So when I start dragging my playhead, we can see how well it's drifting up and down. And that's actually not bad in that corner. So we're going to leave that one alone. Let's hit the select tool to jump to the next one. That's our little shiny point up here. Let's come through. And there, yeah, so we can see a bit of drift there. So we'll fix that in a minute. I'm going to have a look through the other points first and just see how well they're behaving. Yeah, there's a little bit of drift there. And finally, our top corner over here. Yeah, so there's a bit of drift there. So we're going to fix these. So the first thing we're going to do is find the point where it's still stable in the shot, and we'll move it forward. So I'm going to start with this shot up in the top left corner. We'll keep going through. Ah, so there, when the camera starts to pan up, we get a problem. So I'm just going to wait for that to happen there. So about frame 75, I'm just going to set a point for that. Now, the key point here, Whenever we set a keyframe, this keyframe all points means that every single point in the shot is now also keyframed. So if I select the next one, you can see it's also got a keyframe. So let's just jump back. So whenever you're working with a just track, just use the key forward and back to jump to the individual points. And this is a good way to make sure that all your points are matching. So if you've done a keyframe here, for example, so if I click the auto, for example, to make sure it's sitting in the right spot, that keyframe is now set on this keyframe, this keyframe, and this keyframe for all the points. So if you switch over and you're like working somewhere else and select a different point, you can see that keyframe pop up. And so you can just jump to that one using the keyframe tools to make sure that you're lining up with the rest. So it's just helpful to keep aligning those keyframe points until you can't. Uh, we've got effective keyframe range in this, and again, I recommend watching the tutorial on this that Elizabeth Postal just recently did because it's a very good primer on how keyframe ranges work in Adjust Track. So I'm just gonna go now and just cycle through these and make sure they're all looking okay. Select. Now that one's a little bit off, so I'm gonna click Auto for that one. So auto does a very good job of jumping to the right spot. When it doesn't, you can just drag it to the vicinity using the mouse and then click auto and then it'll usually find it. So let's just come through, that's all fine. Okay, so now let's deal with the actual camera drift. So we've got a bit of a camera drift about there, it settles. What you wanna do is try and drag the playhead until you see a settling. If it starts to move somewhere else after the settle, you don't wanna set a keyframe there. You wanna try and get it where it just pauses at the peak of that movement. So I'm going to keep dragging through until about there. 
So I'm going to click auto on that one, and you can see it jumps back. And we'll do the same thing again. So I'm going to come through here. This point is actually fine, so we could leave it. If you are feeling sort of particularly pedantic about it, you can also click auto just to make sure it looks correct. This one is quite off. You can see quite a drag. And this is going to be our problem point for a lot of it because that's where that highlight tracking was done. So let's just click auto on that one. Good. Jump around. Yeah, so that one's drifted off a bit. Auto again. And we just keep on going through until we've found all those points. So let's just go back to our top frame. You've got to be methodical with this. Like, it's not something that you can just drag around. It's very good to just keep on moving around and checking each individual point and then referencing the other points. It's a meticulous process for a reason. So we can see a little bit of a drift about... Uh, it starts to happen about there. So I'm going to add another keyframe. Let's just go through... Make sure all of those are fine. And let's come back to the original point. So yeah, just frame by frame by frame, we can see as it's drifted off a little bit there. Auto. We do say that if you have a little bit too much keyframing going on here, it's probably trying to try and think about how you're going to retrack it because you don't want to spend hundreds of keyframes in the adjust track tool that's not really what it's for if you're starting to noodle every single frame then you've got problems with the original track and you can try and fix that so i'm pretty happy with that how that looks that one's fine let's just check this point one more time this problem point here in the middle of our shot is our biggest problem so we're just going to quickly go through and check so he's got a few problems here so i'm going to turn off keyframe all points for this guy and we're just going to keyframe this one now so I'm going to check he's off there he's definitely so you can see how that tree passes through the shot in the current frame here it's a bit wobbly And that'll probably do. So let's have a zoom out and have a look. So we're going to switch back to the track module now, and I'm going to turn on that insert clip again. So we get the grid back, and let's just play that back now and have a look. So that's looking a lot more stable now. So now that we've got this track done, we want to actually build a plate because you can see that the window is framed here nicely on this frame, and then it pans up. If we want to get a good dirt profile on this, we really need to see the entire plate. We could do this just by adding decals to it and just dirtying up the corners. That's a perfectly acceptable way to do things. But if we want a sort of continuous sort of paint on this work, we really need to build the full plate. So what I'm going to do is call this one Window Track. And then we're going to create a new frame. So I'm going to pull out here, grab the X-Blind Rectangle tool, and just draw a nice big plate like this. We're going to call this window plate. Whoop, and it helps if you spell that correctly. And then what we're going to do is make sure that it's linked to the window track in linked track and click on adjusted. Because we want to make sure that the adjustments we just did are actually working. So if we drag through the shot, you'll see that spline move around. Sorry for that, I was just double checking to see where my chat window has gone, but it is not there. So I apologise if you're asking questions at the moment, but OBS has decided to hide my chat window somewhere. <laughs> so uh, if you're asking questions, I will try and answer them in, in the post uh, section, sorry. Alright, so we've built up a big frame here, and now we want to go over to Megaplate. So double check to make sure that adjusted checkbox is set when you link to track because otherwise it won't carry across the adjusted frames and again we can leave all this default and just build that plate by pressing render 
And what this does is it builds kind of a hodgepodge of reflected frames of the entire scene. So you can now see the top of the frame and the bottom of the frame all in one. And we don't really care how this looks because we're not going to be using this frame in the composite, we're just using it as reference. So I'm going to click create and I've already got one here so let's just uh, call this uh, number two and we'll hit save and now we can go over to Photoshop and actually paint our grime in. So let's go over to Photoshop. So I've already got a frame here that we built earlier or we can build the other one so we can go over to open Grab number two, so about the same. So you can see how it builds up. Uh, you've got that frame area, and then you can paint in. So let's just talk a little bit about dirt. So dirt, when you're actually painting on stuff like windows and corners and walls, you've got to think about the accumulation of dirt. And I highly recommend when you're doing this to actually work with reference. It's really, really useful to use to see how windows are compiling dirt. And you can even see it in the original shot a little bit. You can see a little bit of crud firming at the corners. And think also about how windows are cleaned. Windows are cleaned in a circular motion and we often don't get into the corners uh, when it's a personal job. A window cleaner obviously does a great job, but if you're doing it yourself, often you just get problems in every corner. And I'm going to pull up a reference that I shot here and I actually use this. Uh, this is shot from my bathroom window so it's hideous as you can see. Um, lots of cobwebs in the corners, lots of weird things. So this is just a frosted window pane. Frosted windows are actually very very good for working with uh, building textures for windows because you don't have any of the problems of reflection or light pass or things like that. So we're going to use this as a base. We could just go ahead and paint. You can see some very dark corners. You can see how stuff builds into the corners. You can see sort of the general smattering of dust and things that happens across the window as well. I'm going to start by actually flipping this upside down because we're actually going to use this as a texture inside the shot. So I'm going to go over to my edit window. Ooh, we need to actually make sure it's editable first. Let's double click on that. And we'll go over to Edit, Transform, and we'll just say Flip Vertical because we want to get the bottoms of the shot. There's, you can't see much of the top because of the reflections in the original window, if we look at that. Up here we're not actually going to see that much because of the reflection, so we don't really need to paint it too much. We're going to just deal with the bottom corners here and some of them around here and maybe add some smattering in. So the first thing I'll do here is I'm going to do a desaturation pass. So let's come up to Image, Adjustments, and we'll just say Desaturate because we only really care about the luminosity of the shot. And then I'm going to select a range in the middle to get rid of this sort of area that doesn't matter, the light area here. So we'll come up to Select and Color Range. And we'll just grab this middle section. I'm going to keep the fuzziness quite high because we want to fade off this quite a bit. If you bring the fuzziness too far down you're just going to get too much of like the light bloom in the shot which will kind of make it look a bit weird. So let's just pull out the fuzziness quite a bit because you want dirt to be subtle you, unless you're really going for a hard grime look. On windows generally people try and keep them a little bit clean but if you want to enhance the grime Less is actually more in many say cases. So I'm going to just um, yeah find a good middle ground about there because we want to keep those bits around here. So we'll select that area and then we're just going to delete that. Maybe twice just to get a bit of the fade off. All right. So now we've got this profile. Another thing to talk about too is thinking about uh, blending versus opacity. A lot of dirt is going to purely be obscuring, not actually adding colour or sort of screen overlay kind of stuff. When you can, it's better to paint with opacity than it is to just do a straight overlay blend because it starts to look a bit weird when you have something that is a different colour sort of blending through and not working quite well. So I'm going to select all this and copy and bring it over to my mega plate and we're just going to paste that in. So obviously huge at the moment, so let's just scale it down. 
and we're going to just start by working on that mid window. Now we might run out of time, so I'll show you the basics here, and then uh, I'll show you a finished shot after we're done, but I'll show you the basics of what I'm planning to do here. So let's go ahead and edit, and I'll transform, we'll do a distort, and we'll just pull this into the corners. Like so. And once again, I apologize if you are in the stream and asking questions, for my chat window has disappeared. So I will um, endeavor to answer any questions after the stream. So I've just distorted that into place getting it into those frame edges. We don't want to overlap because that's not how it works. All right, so we've got that. We've built it in. We could keep it about this because it's actually, you know, it's a reasonable size. And remember, we're not using the background plate. If I just turn this off for a second, you can see how we're going here. Uh, I'm going to fade it off a little bit because that's a very sharp edge. So let's just grab our erase tool. I've got it on a nice soft brush already. It's going to pull this in. If you really want to see what's going on quite well, another good option is to add a new layer between your color layer and the dirt layer and just put in a white and a black. So I'm going to pull in a white frame here so we can see. And again, I'm going to pull in a black frame. Let's just flip that around. And it just helps you see the profile a little bit better when you're working. So I'm just going to keep it on this one for a second so I can soften up this here, so we're just going to do a quick pull down. I've got this on a fairly opaque erase, so let's just pull it up to about 50% because we want a softer edge here. Uh, let's pull this back up to maybe 80. Because hard edges will look a bit strange on this side of the window. I'm just going to fade that off a little bit. So let's have a look at that. That started looking better. And again, you can adjust the opacity a little bit if you're not a fan of how that's looking. And we can also just duplicate these a lot. I'm not going to go through every single window because I'll, I'll show you the final profile I've built. But the next thing we want to do is just enhance those areas. So we'll grab our paintbrush. And again, quite a soft brush, soft round brush. And we'll just grab some of those colors. So we'll grab that one. And we'll pull up that. And we'll just start painting into the corners a little bit. If that's too opaque, we'll just pull that back a little bit in the transparency. And I'll create a new layer so that we can play with this a little bit. So again, this is a bit rough but we can clean it up afterwards. It's always good to kind of start the dirt profile first and then clean up afterwards. Don't get a little bit too fussy at the beginning because you can always go back in and soften these out with various scatter delete tools and things like that. Scattering brushes for a race are really, really handy to help build up sort of sharper edges on the profile. So if you've got a good kind of general um, deletion brush like you know something like this you can get some nice sort of scattering in the deletion there so we'll just paint some of this in now so let's to create a new now this is sort of just your standard uh, scatter paintbrush what we're going to do here is just drag some down I'll make it slightly larger and again I'm using this on a separate frame now, when you were doing this, it is actually a uniform size at the moment. So a good thing to do once you've actually scattered over here a little bit is to do a transform on it. So I will come up to edit, transform, and again, do a distort. And just scale down that dirt and scale it up on the other side in the perspective that you've been painting. Otherwise, it does look a bit fake because you've got this consistent pattern of dirt going through your shot 
So even if you're using a good brush, sometimes it's good just to distort it in the perspective that you've been painting it in a little bit so that you've got something slightly more realistic. So that's starting to look pretty good. Let's have a look at that. So the paint map itself will look a little bit all over the place, but that's fine because what you're really caring about is how it's scattering on here. And once again, we'll just pull that opacity down a little bit. Like so. So once you've got a profile like this, I've got one built already, so let's have a look at that. That's a sort of a lighter one, more like this. We can just go ahead and save that. It's going to say, hey, do you want the layers? And you can say yes, so just a TIFF, because Mocha will read in the TIFF file. And then we can go back over to Mocha. So over in Mocha, I'm not going to use the Mega Plate. Uh, I'm going to import it again, because when you import uh, an insert clip, it reads it the single frame across the entire plate. Mega Plates are based on clean plates, so they always start on their single frame, so it won't repeat over frames unless you change this value to all, as in A double L. So it's better to just import it again. So I'm going to go ahead and import. We'll choose. We'll grab that one that we just painted. Let's go over to insert. We'll get off a mega plant render. There we go. All right. So I'm going to turn off my grid. And we'll just zoom in here and have a look. All right, so there's our plate in place. We'll hide our layers for a second. And here in insert is where you can start playing around a little bit with the uh, opacity if you want to. You could try and use overlay, but again, I, I don't recommend using a blend for this because when things come into the shot, it doesn't quite look right. If you want to use the blend modes to help adjust things like contrast and brightness and gamma and things like that to adjust the reflection, that's better to do back in the compositing package. So if we scrub through the shot here, we can now see that dirt's in place. Again, a little bit too high on here, so I'm going to pull the opacity down a little bit. Let's play that back. So you can really see it when her body comes up against the window. And like every demo, are we going to get a crash? Nope, it was just having a think. That's good. <laughs> right. There we go. All right. So we're reasonably happy with that. Now, there's two ways you can approach this now. You can render it directly. Uh, if that you do that, I recommend turning on motion blur. You can also, if we just uh, close this now and save. Let's go back over to After Effects. So we can now go ahead and bring it as a module render. So we come over to Insert Composite and click Render. And then our frame immediately comes in. Now, insert module is you know, a slightly slower way to render. You could also just bring the dirt map in if you wanted to. So if you, wanted, if you preferred doing it that way, what you could do instead is actually bring it in like this. So let's come over to here, project. Let's just import that clean plate we just made. Pop it into the shot. So that will sit directly where it's expected. So I'll turn off the render in insert. Now if we want to use this, we would generate the tracking data. So the way we would do this is create our tracking data on the window plate, because that's what we were using. And we would create a CC power pin, because this frame is larger than uh, the original plate, because it's a, a mega plate, not the source size. We want to create a CC power pin so we can stretch out the shot. The CC power pin originally is going to be based off the surface, but then you have to readjust the CC power pin to make it actually fit. So we'll apply it to the dirty window and apply the export. So you can see how it jumps up there. So let's go over to the mega plate. We'll bring down expansion. And then we can move that back into position. So we'll pop that over. We'll bring it down. And then that will track through with the correct mapping that way. 
So that's a slightly faster way to render and preview. But if you're adding things like motion blur and things like that, it's probably better to just use the direct render, which is insert composite, or better yet, use insert cutout. So you can actually set that up uh, that way. So that's uh, the window side. So we talked about adjust track and paint and things like that. If we look at the final shot I did over here, this is the one I built up previously. We can play that back and see how that looks. So the main thing to take away from that is, yeah, use adjust track for glass because often glass is not going to work. Um, and build into those corners for windows, get a good smattering, try and use opacity versus blends to help the dirt map in correctly, and uh, you'll get shots like this. So we're going to switch over to Nuke now and talk about tracking dirt to organic shapes. So I'm going to close up After Effects. And I'm just going to quickly see if I can get my chat window back up because it's uh, missing from my... Nope, can't do it. <laughs> so we will, uh, again, we'll just deal with that later. All right, so here's a shot we've got here. I'm going to um, actually just show you the before. So what we're dealing with is this shot. And we're going to do this to it. So we're going to add a bit of dirt to the jacket, uh, to the face, to the, the chest here, and to the arm over here. So the important thing here is we're going to be using Nuke with an Alembic workflow because Alembic workflow for warp uh, for dirt is actually very, very fast. So let's go and have a look at that. All right. So we've started with a simple Mocha Pro track down here. And we'll have a look at Mocha Pro to start with. And I'm intentionally loading this first so you can actually see all the different tracks I've done here. When you're working with organic movements, you're not going to be able to just do a singular track on the body. You're going to have to do lots of tiny little patches. So let's just turn on all these for a second and you can see all the different ones I've tried. We've got a chest track here for tracking with the way her breathing is moving. We've got the side of her face to track in the cheek dirt. We've got the lapel part here of her jacket, uh, this side. We've got a nostril, which I didn't end up using. Uh, same with the lips, I didn't end up using because visually you weren't going to see much, so I just was doing that as an attempt, but we left it in just to show. And then the arm, again, is one long thing down here. You can't do sort of a large mesh track on a lot of these because the planar shapes are just a bit too different, and it's better to do individual tracks to get bits and pieces. But this does actually end up working to your advantage in Nuke, because when you're tracking with Nuke uh, using the Alembic uh, exports in Mocha, you can start to actually build up interesting plates, not just with uh, general clean plating by just painting on straight onto the body, but you can also combine it with decals and things like that. So we'll have a look at each individual one here. So I'm not going to go into the tracking here because tr this would take some time. I'm just going to show you exactly what we did here. So in these particular shots, you always want to do an overlap. So for the face here, what we've done is I've tracked from the end of this shot. You can see if I start... Yeah, I tracked from this planar point here. You always want to try and find the most front-facing part that will get the most texture detail when you want to start mesh tracking. So I've started right here where her face is pointing up, and then I've tracked forwards and backwards from that point. We've kept the mesh size also quite small. You'll also notice here that we've done a uniform track here. And the reason we do uniform rather than automatic is that uniform gives you a better over texture painting options for when you export the Alembic file into Nuke. Automatic is really good for finding individual feature points. Let's just destroy this for a second by showing you that. 
It's going to tell me it's destroying my tracking data, but that's okay. It will try and find the interesting points to make tracking easier. But when you actually export this Alembic file to Nuke, the texture is going to get stretched weirdly because it's just dealing with these polygons going all over the place. So a uniform track in general, even though sometimes it won't track as well, is a better option. And when we're talking about exports, we're talking about export track, Alembic mesh data. So that's the ABC file. So that will work in things like Nuke, Fusion, Flame, uh, to some extent Hint Film, but not really, uh, and uh, obviously 3D packages as well. But importantly with Nuke, it gives you the UV maps with this reference frame. So you can start applying texture to that reference frame and get it in the right spot. Okay, so when we track this to, we try and make sure that we're not dealing with too many shadow obstructions. We can see down here, uh, let's just close and reopen the shot. Because we generated that meshing correctly. Just have a look at her face again. We'll come back to that uh, frame point. All right. So if we hide the mesh for a second, we can see here she's got a lot of shadows around her face when she turns. So in general, you want to try and avoid those a little bit because the mesh tracker is quite sensitive to this kind of data. So if you can just latch on to the main areas of the texture first, you can then adjust the mesh later. So you can see I've just avoided it a little bit by mapping out uh, with the mask, and the mask will tell it to ignore it. Um, you can also see too, if we turn the mesh back on, that the mesh is slightly outside the spline. Uh, and this is, happens uh, by default when you have vertices on spline connected. This is just a good way of keeping the mesh locked in place around the edges so you don't get kind of a warped bleed in your mesh track. So all of those things are good to keep in mind. And the same goes for all the other tracks I've done here. So I've done the face track here is the major one. I've done the jacket track. The jacket track is both benefiting as a mask and as a place to track our decals. So if we look here, uh, we'll turn off the mesh again. I'm using it also to drive the roto edge along the edge of the zip jacket so that when I track this shape it's getting masked out correctly because we don't care too much again about so you can see how this mesh is really badly distorted here we don't really care too much what's happening here because it's never going to be seen uh, it's just being masked out by there so it's just useful to keep different rotor shapes masking out different parts of the mesh so that you can track individual areas all right So once we have all of our shapes where you want dirt, we could have done extra, we could just do this ad nauseum. You could add more tracks to the jeans, you could add tracks to the top of the shoulder, all those things. I've kept it simple just to keep things going. You can then have two options to paint in your work. You can paint in a full plate. So similar to what we did with the uh, window before, you can go ahead and build a whole profile with a clean plate and then track those in individually. The problem with doing that from a render point of view, so if you just did it directly inside Mocha, is that the mesh track requires that it's expanded. So for example here, if I turn on the surface, at the moment you can see it's around the main shape. If I expanded that out, the influence of that mesh to this whole area is going to be much smaller. So if you look at the insert, and we turn on the grid warp, these grid warp points are now only being influenced a little bit by the mesh inside if we're using power mesh warp. So in general, you wanna keep it localized to the area when you're rendering. And this is why decals are really, really useful. Uh, so things like little patches rather than big shapes like this. So let's just undo that. So that's exactly what we've done on the jacket, for example. Over here, you can see I've got the surface quite small in this area. Let's just turn off grid warp for a second so we can see that. 
and we've just got a patch decal here. So these are the burn mark uh, decals from Action VFX. They actually supply a free set of these uh, that you can play around with. Uh, but most of Action VFX's work is really, really good, so it's worth actually subscribing to their website. So we've used a few of their burn mark and blast mark things here from the free pack just to demonstrate how well they work. So go and check them out if you want to see more interesting stuff. So same goes for this one. This is another decal here. So once again, the surface area is small, so it's influenced easily by the power mesh. In every case, we're using power mesh warp to make sure that these are warped. Let's just turn off all of these for a second and we'll just look at that jacket one for a second. So if we play this back, you can see that as she breathes, the grid warp is being warped by the mesh track and we're getting a good subtle movement of the grid overall to make sure that it's warping correctly with her jacket. So we're keeping the patches small again so that we can get individual movement for the individual bits of dirt that we're dealing with. And once again, my computer is deciding to pause. <laughs> so we will wait for that to finish. Okay. So, but we're not going to render today. So what we were talking about before is a lembel that works. For each of these individual patches, I've exported out this mesh. Uh, so if we look at the chest, we've exported that mesh. If we look at the face, we've exported that mesh. To each has individual Alembic files. So I'm going to close up Mocha and show you how we work with those. So let's zoom out here and you can see a reasonably complicated node graph, not super expansive, but enough so that we can see what's going on. So if any time you bring in an Alembic file from Mocha, you get a Regio and you get a camera. So the way we project this information, so this, for example, is the red jacket burn right here. So let's just take a look at that first. So when we import this stuff, let's just do an example. I will uh, read it in, so we'll press R key, and we go to our Alembic data, and I'm going to grab my red jacket burn uh, Alembic file, and it asks you how you want to set it up. I'm just going to say create all in one node, and we get a Regio, and we get a camera. In order for us to project this information correctly, what we need to do is set this up as a scanline renderer. So we're just going to select those two, set scan line, and then we have this. So this is our just base Alembic file. If we play this back, you'll see it moves around with her jacket, as expected. But at the moment, it doesn't have any texture, and it's not actually projected correctly. You can see an odd frame number. This is a UHD shot, so you know 3840 by 2160. So this file is not actually projected onto anything useful. We could project it onto the back of the original footage, but that's going to cause compositing problems later. So what we do instead is we just grab a constant here. So I'm just going to copy this one. This is just an alpha constant. There's actually no RGB on it. It's just to define the UHD frames. So if we look at that again, we've got that. So then we can build in the decals. So the way we build in the decals is just to read it in. So I'm going to come in here. We'll go to Clips. I've got Action VFX here, Textures. And we'll go to the, yeah, the burn marks. Let's just grab a random one. And then we can feed that in here. Now, you're not going to see anything because it's currently not composited on top of anything. So I'm going to just hide that for a second and we'll look at the original one. So let's pull down here. So I've merged over that point to the top. So we'll merge that over to the source file. So here's our... So the way that you can position these, let's just disable that. When you actually bring it in for the first time, the file is going to be quite dark because the texture is pushing out to all the boundaries of the mesh. So in order to fix that, we can just tweak it using a transform. So over here, I've just adjusted it to position and display. So here I could just move it around. We can scale it up and down by just using the scale tool. 
And this is just a really nice creative way to actually place this stuff so it actually sits where you want it on the mesh. If you're ever not quite sure how far the boundaries of the mesh are going, you can just turn off the image or just view the scanline renderer with the image off to actually see what's going on. Let's just pull that up here, so that's that one. We can actually see our mesh here in 3D. And then you can actually sort of play with the boundaries in there if you need to. So we can come up here to go to transform and start sort of moving around this scale. So let's just go back to the merge. You always want to work in merged mode over the top of the source so that you can actually see the plate. And then we can just adjust the transform this way. So that's, that's one way to add uh, this information in. And we've done the same here for the uh, face. So I'll pull this down to, let's have a look at the face one. So the face is a very similar thing. If we look at the mesh here, so there's our jacket, there's our face. In terms of the face, because there's a much sort of uh, bigger area here, we actually had to bring in the roto as well. Same way as you do the mesh data, you just export shape data, bring it out as a uh, clipboard and paste the roto face in. And that just helps you blend over. And you have to do that between the scanline renderer and the merge, because if you do it on the mesh side, obviously it's not going to work. So you want to actually mask the render of that. And that just gives us a soft edge to make sure that that's falling off her cheekbone and you don't get the harsh mesh edges. If I turn off this one, you can see what's going on there. You can see that it's sort of kind of a rigid edge on there. And it also helps you just being able to tweak this. So if I pull this back and we'll go to the roto, we can go over to our shape. Let's grab this. And we, can, if we want to make it look nicer, we can blend it around like that. So using a combination of both the roto and the dirt uh, texture is a really, really nice way to do it. So that's the decal approach, just using those Action VFX uh, burn mark decals. The other way is to actually do, do it because you get sort of more creative control over the overall paint, and then you can project it to individual patches. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So when we actually created this, let's go back to our Mocha Pro for a second. And we've got about seven minutes left, so we'll uh, rush through this as quickly as we can. So when you create this, you can go ahead and just select any layer at all, and just go over to Mega Plates, sorry, uh, sorry uh, Remove, and create a clean plate. And then that just gives you a full plate to work with in here. Or you can just go ahead and copy the frame separately in Nuke. But all we're after is just the reference frame that we want to work with. So in, you know, in this particular case, I would go for that similar frame where she's facing upwards, where we can paint the texture into her face. It just depends on where you want to start for that paintwork. So when we've got that, we can go over to Photoshop like we did with the window. And let's just open up that. So I should have... Yep, this one called Human Floor Dirt Plate. And here's what we've got. So I'm using a proxy here, so that's why you can see the, the preview here. But what we just did here is we painted over the top of the plate. We just got a brush and we started painting in. So I, again, recommend when you're working with dirt to just start and then fix issues later. Mainly the way I actually handled this was actually grabbing the lasso tool, grabbing something in the background, copying it and pasting it. Oops, helps if I copy the background. Let's do that again. And then pulling that down somewhere and then actually working in the back dirt in just to get a dirt profile. Um, it's always just good because like you can actually sort of noodle a lot with dirt and it's just easier to start and then fix as you go rather than just sort of worrying that you're not going to make your dirt look realistic and things like that. You paint in and then pull out as you need. So I've got three areas here. I've got the chest where there's a bit of a stain. We've got the jacket paint, which we didn't end up using. And we've got the arm here, which it sort of paints on the edges of her jacket where the points are sticking out. So using that profile, just turning off the back layer, you can use this whole paint frame as a texture 
uh, on individual parts of the Alembic file. So let's go back over to Nuke and have a look at that. So that's what we're doing with these two. So I'm using a single paint frame up here connected to two separate Alembic shots. So we'll look here first. So that covers the arm here. So if we look at that individually, it's just a bit of a paint frame here. And that's only on that section there. Let's turn off our roto here for a second. And then on the other one, we're using the chest area over here. So the chest area needs some masking because the jacket gets in the way. So we've actually exported those two masks out again. We've got the chest mask and we've got the jacket mask. So the chest mask is masking in the dirt. The jacket mask is masking out the dirt so that we keep them in the same area. So then they're combined to match. So that mask area is just stopping the dirt from bleeding over into the jacket edge. And then we've got the overall track here. But this is a good way to reference because you can keep painting the original frame and then go back into Nuke and just keep on making new patches where you need them to project the dirt. This way you don't have to worry about individual files. You can just work off the single paint plate. But it does also give you a little bit of less creative control back in the composite. At least with the decals, for example, over here. So this one here, for example. At least with this one here, you've got the option of adjusting as you go to make it look exactly how you like. When you're dealing with a singular frame, and having to paint uh, in one frame in Photoshop, you're sort of controlled by that singular reference frame. So if something doesn't look right later in the shot, and it doesn't quite look right, how do you adjust that and things like that? So you've got a balance between the two. If you want more creative control over the overall paint to get the look, uh, you can do it via the single plate method and then project it onto individual Alembic files, or you can do the decal method and then have control over individual points. Decals can sometimes look a little bit painted on because they're literally decals, but you have to define that by warping the mesh a little bit and making sure that it sort of matches correctly. So this decal, for example, is curving nicely because the mesh is curving nicely with the jacket. So it's a bit of creative control. And you've obviously you can combine these together. You could do layer two Alembic files on top of each other and then composite them together to get some interesting effects. So that's how we would approach this for dirt in Nuke. It's extremely fast, like compared to just directly rendering uh, via, say, After Effects or things like that, you get very, very fast feedback with Alembic rendering. Now, part of that is because I'm not currently... Uh, I'm not currently uh, doing motion blur on these. There's not a large shutter angle on each of these cameras. If you want to get more motion blur in the shot, you do have to go in and adjust the camera shutter angles on these. It's a, also uh, a point to note that you don't get to have a singular camera because each of these ones is a separate projection into a 2D plane. So if you want to do an overall motion blur adjustment, you'd have to kind of write an expression to link the shutter angles of all these together. But it does give you a bit more creative control over, again, how much motion blur is on each projection. But you can see how fast that plays back just using a limbic projection inside Nuke. And that is all. So thanks very much for your time today. I'm hoping that was a useful demonstration for you. And if you've got any questions, do ask them in that chat or in the comments, and we'll try and get to them afterwards. Apologies for the latency and the, uh, the chat issues, but uh, we hope that the actual instruction was interesting for you. So we'll see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.